So thanks everybody for coming out, spending a little bit of your Friday afternoon with me. And this talk, as Olivia mentioned, is called Waterway Access and Inclusion. Um, I will mention off the bat, this is general informational purposes. We're not making you know, lawyer-client relationship here. It's not legal advice, uh, although I will be talking about legal concepts. Um, so uh, my name is Tim Fitchett. I'm an attorney with Fair Shake Environmental Legal Services. I am uh, currently finishing up uh, this guidebook that we're calling Navigating Waterway Access. Um, it was created with a grant from the William Penn Foundation and is focused on waterway access issues within the Delaware River Basin. And so what we've done in the guidebook is to outline the laws surrounding public and private property, um, especially around water, and then discuss how you can you know, change those relationships, turning private property into public property, or otherwise kind of getting access to uh, rivers or creating access points to get there. Uh, we also talk about the permitting processes and how that kind of looks as far as getting riverway access if you're trying to build a dock or something like that. And we talk about some of the other things that I'll talk about today, which are a lot of really cool ideas from um, around the Delaware River Basin with uh, helping increase access to waterways. So the goals of the talk, um, first I wanna talk about the, the importance of waterway access and how it is an equitable issue um, that we should all be kind of thinking about as you know, advocates for these kinds of things and its correlation with underserved communities. And then I'm gonna move into basic property rights and learning how to identify and evaluate riparian ownership. Um, by riparian, I'm gonna use that term a bunch. It's the property on the edge of any waterway is the riparian property. It's called the riparian owner. Um, usually owns out into the middle of that waterway. And so the, the property rights really change a lot. And so we'll kind of go over that. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, different legal mechanisms that can be used to increase ownership or increase um, public access to these uh, locations. And that includes um, agreements that can be made with private property owners or um, from sort of a more uh, larger, slightly larger scale on the local municipal level. There's a lot of different changes that can be made at that level to help increase um, or uh, much larger regional things. So like I mentioned, there's a, some really neat things that the different states have done uh, in, within the Delaware River Basin to help increase the uh, public's access to waterways. So the first question is really why? Why is waterway access an equity issue? Um, what does it really have to do with, with diversity and equity and inclusion? And like all access to nature, waterway access has tangible, quantifiable benefits, right? Studies have been done to show the health benefits of having access to trails, having access to rivers, having access to beaches, right? There are quantifiable health benefits, quantifiable social benefits. Um, and there are also educational benefits of just, you know, being able to go and learn about those different places. And so having access to those, if there are quantifiable benefits to having access, it necessarily means that those that do not have access are in some way not privy, they don't have that same privilege, right? And so it's, it's important to try and increase that access so that everybody has it and it's not just um, the, the privilege. And sadly, like many amenities in America, access, waterway access is imbalanced to favor uh, the white population. It just is. Um, it's an environmental justice issue and it falls in line with so many other imbalances in American society. Uh, some by, you know, sort of design, some of them not, but, you know, there are more whites in rural areas and simply by a matter of geography, there are more 
rivers and streams in rural areas, right? It's, the urban areas are smaller compared to you know, the rural areas. There's necessarily more streams there. If there are also more white people living in those communities, they have more access to those streams. Uh, there's also a lot of issues with income distribution and disposable income. It costs money uh, to get to uh, many rivers, right? It takes time to get, um, take time off of work to make the trip, it takes gas money, um, all of these things. And then home ownership is another that, you know, may not uh, be readily apparent, but having the ability to park a boat out back or put a boat in a garage is something that can be taken for granted as, um, but that does really have an effect on uh, the ability to access waters. So when it comes to rural waterways, again, most of the accessible waterways are in the rural areas. And so you need personal transport to get there. And the 14% of uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities and households don't have a personal vehicle. And that's compared to only 6% of uh, white households that don't have access to a personal vehicle. So that's just one impediment just to even getting out to these rural waters. And then um, again, the disposable funds to, for the gas to go out there, the time off of work to make it out there, uh, boat rentals, right? That's all extra money that you need in order to access uh, waterways. And there are 25% of BIPOC communities uh, living under the poverty level compared to only 10% for whites. So again, there's this very large disparity uh, between who has the disposable income to access the water even if they could get there. Um, and again, there are also more uh, BIPOC uh, communities and, and people living in the cities and suburban areas which are further away from those water resources. So it just makes it more difficult. When we shift into thinking about urban waters, right? Many urban, uh, many urban centers are built around rivers and about around water resources, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the access is there, uh, because waterways in cities are often in really bad shape, right? The reason that cities were built on waterways was because of the transport of goods and services, right? It made it easy to get things from one to another. It's been that way through pretty much all society. Everything's built around water access. Um, that also led to a lot of industry being in those areas. One, because they had access to the rivers for transport of their goods. They could transport their, you know, have their factory, put their stuff right on a barge, ship it up the river, uh, and take it to a new market. They also uh, had a really easy way to get rid of their industrial waste, right? They have, it's the classic factory um, image, right? You just have a big pipe sticking out of the back, dumping uh, whatever goo comes out of the factory into the rivers and polluting them. And for you know, almost a century of the Industrial Revolution, that was just normal and fair game and nobody said anything, no, nothing happened. And so these rivers that are in these urban centers have had, were at least subject to you know, a century's worth of sort of unregulated pollution. And it wasn't until the Clean Water Act came about uh, in the 1970s that that became an issue at all. Right, and then it was slowly getting people to uh, getting these factories in order. Um, and now a lot of these areas, through um, the work of, of you know some really great organizations um, and and people and the EPA and everybody, have made these once incredibly polluted rivers much 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 better. Um, you know, I, I live in Pittsburgh and. Apparently, you know, 20, 30 years ago, these rivers, nobody would ever consider going in them. Uh, but now they are um, able to be kayaked, able to be canoed, boated on um, without too much worry. <coughs> so you know, it's to say that, you know, even the waters that are close to, you know, urban communities aren't necessarily um, accessible due to these sort of historic issues. Now we run into another issue when the, uh, uh, as industry is moving overseas, otherwise shutting down, moving into the country, um, you know, to get away from the, the expense of property in cities, um, they are 
a lot of those areas are beginning to gentrify, right? They're, people are moving in, they're turning uh, these big warehouses into restaurants and big you know, luxury loft apartments. You know, they're right on the river, it's great. <laughs> but this causes yet another issue because originally, a lot of these industrial areas along the river, the next neighborhood over would be a community of color, often working for low wages in these industrial areas um, and, and kind of living with the pollution that these uh, the, this industrial district would create. And now the industry's left, the you know quality, air quality, all of that's finally getting better, but now gentrification occurs and um, these communities are getting kind of pushed out again and priced out as sort of the gentrification um, uh, takes over. So the other issue, and I'll, I'll talk about some ways to address some of this later, um, is that when private developers move into these areas, they'll often try to take over the whole of uh, the, the, the water access, right? So they'll say, okay, well, we own the property all the way up to the water. This is ours. This is going to be for our you know, private condominium community that we're building here. And that again cuts people off from ways to to be near uh, the water and access those those resources. And so the the focus of this talk, I'm going to kind of focus more on urban waters, mainly because I think that the there's sort of one big way to kind of create access to rural waters, and it also applies to, to urban waters, and that's more that's just getting people there. Right, getting buses organized, getting boats um, together to get people from urban areas out to these already accessible waters, and it's not necessarily. In in, in the guidebook, we talk a lot about how to get everything open, right? Where every waterway should be open. If you can put a kayak on it, you should be able to be on it. It can't. It shouldn't be private. Um, but a lot of that is more about recreational users that want to you know expand their um, the number of rivers and and streams that they can access whereas there are plenty of accessible rivers that people that don't normally have that access would be perfectly uh, happy to go to right so we don't necessarily have to open up new rivers if we can just get people there and get people in boats um, then that's one way to kind of address this access issue, but also not one that our, uh, our guidebook talks at all about because we're much more trying to talk about sort of the legal nuances and legal means to go about this, not uh, sort of the act, uh, activism and, and organization uh, side of it. So I'm going to kind of focus more on the urban uh, just due to that. So the I'm going to kind of go now into a bit of a legal primer, just overview basic concepts of property law um, to understand some of the things that are going to come later about how we can actually make some changes. So when lawyers talk about uh, property rights, we often refer to it as a bundle of sticks. And you have all of these different rights that are all in a big bundle of sticks and as a property owner, if you own it in fee simple period, then you have every single stick in the bundle. That's the right to exclude people. It's the right to allow access to people. It's the right to build something. Um, you know, if you want to tear up all your grass, you're welcome to do that, right? That's your right to do it. The thing is that you can actually take some of those sticks out and give them to another individual. And so, uh, classic examples like a, a, a trail that runs over your property, you can allow the public the right to travel on an easement across your property and say that you, you're allowed within this, you know, three foot from here to here. It's on the books. It's a recorded document. Public's allowed there. If they were to step one foot off of the three foot path that you've allowed, then they're now trespassing, right? They're only allowed on that bit. And you can do a lot with uh, easements, and I will talk a little bit more about that, but there really is a lot that you can kind of play with with this easement. But that's one example of taking a property stick away 
and giving it to another. You could also own the property and rent it, right? And then you know, you're renting your house to somebody else. That means that you are giving them the right to live there for a specific period of time, right? That's a, that's a license to be on the property. Um, businesses that technically own the property that they're on, they are giving you a license. They're giving the property rights stick to you. You are allowed on my property so long as you are, you know, shopping in my store. Um, but if you're just loitering, they can take that property stick away. So just a yeah, background. So again, if somebody has all of the rights of access to their property, then it's private. If somebody has given the rights to the public, then that portion of the land is public or all of it, right? Sometimes um, just behind me is uh, Frick Park. At one point that was privately owned. It was 650 acres owned by the Fricks. They gave 550 acres of that to the public um, and that was, uh, now it is public land, right? So you can have given the right to access to the public. It's also important to note, what, because we're dealing with waterways, that water and land ownership are different in the, so I mentioned riparian ownership earlier. Generally, if you own the land on the side of a river, you own out to the middle of that river. But if it's a public waterway, then you don't get to exclude people, even though you technically own that land, right? Even though you own the land underneath, you can't keep people from above. But that's different. If it's a private waterway, and we'll get into the distinction between public and private, if it's a private waterway, then you don't, then you can exclude people and people could not boat over your submerged land. So it's, it, it becomes a very big difference, especially with waterway access, understanding that um, water over private land could still be publicly accessible. And this is a, a diagram that we, we cooked up for the book. Uh, to kind of explain this this concept a bit. So I'm um, not sure, can you see my mouse? Maybe not. Uh, no. no. No, I didn't think so. Uh, so over where like the swing set is in the factory, in between that, that's supposed to be a private waterway. And you know, even though the land there would be public from the park, you would not be able to access that private waterway because, well, you'd be able to access half of it, but you wouldn't be able to, you know, necessarily kayak on it because that might require you to go to the factory's private land, right? And they're, they own that portion of the river. Uh, where the, the bench and the tree is, that's public land next to a big public waterway. All, all the rest is supposed to be a public waterway. And so you would be able to access that public waterway from that area, from the mountains area, et cetera, get in there and go all the way along it. But where the farm is, that's private property. And you would not be able to get into that public waterway from the farm unless you had permission. Right, you would have to get permission from the private property owner. Um, we have an example of it over by the factory as well. You have to get a permission from the private property owner to access that even though the waterway itself is public and that farmer could never keep you off of that waterway so long as you accessed it from somewhere that you're allowed to access it. So that's just sort of, you know, we have to think about both, are you allowed on the water itself? And how do you get onto the water? They're both a factor to, to think about when we're trying to increase access. <coughs> so there are two ways that a waterway can be public. The first is that it's public as a matter of law. And the second is that it's public as a matter of agreement. So the public as a matter of law is usually due to the public trust doctrine uh, or some statutes that say this water is meant for the public. 
the public is allowed. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the public trust doctrine um, in a moment. The, the second way is public as a matter of agreement, and that's where you take private property and either through a purchase or a donation or an easement, somehow that property is made public. And we're gonna go over a couple of different ways that that, that, that transaction can be, be done. So the public trust doctrine is based on English common law. It came out of uh, the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries um, in England when the kings over that course of time had, <coughs> they had given away the rights, property rights to their buddies for 200 years. And almost every single river in England was owned by some, you know, lord who began to, one, they were putting up tolls and they were saying, you can't come through this way without paying me money. And two, they were setting up what are called weirs. And weirs are a way to stop uh, fish from traveling much, right? And so they would essentially put these big nets up and stop fish from going downstream made them a lot of fish, but the commoners were saying, this is, this is ridiculous, we can't, we can't do anything. We can't travel to the next town over to sell our goods. We can't you know, even go out there and fish where you know, that's our food, this is what we eat. We, we have to be able to access these, these public, uh, or, or these waters or else we're all gonna die and we're not gonna have any commerce. And so part of the Magna Carta was actually an agreement that every um, tidally affected river or waterway in Great Britain was owned by the public and was to be protected by the king for the public in perpetuity. And that meant that all of the toll booths had to be removed, all the weirs had to be removed, and this concept of the importance, right? I mean, it was really the, the people were rising up and saying, you are literally killing us. We literally cannot eat um, because we don't have access to these waterways. Uh, it was so important that it, it, made it, it made it across the, the ocean. And when the US system started up, we adopted that idea and pretty much immediately said, okay, the, the king had, um, you know, the king was the head of state at that point. We, uh, early on in our country's history, we said, okay, well, we're, uh, we got all of our title from the king. The king was the trustee over all of these rivers. And so we, um, the states now and the federal government is now the trustee over all of these rivers um, because they're that important. So the obvious next question is, well, then why isn't every single river open to the public? And this became a bit of a, a court battle and, and public battle about the public rights versus private rights, right? And, and as long as America has been around, there has been a battle between governmental control and individual property rights. So originally, the federal government essentially said, okay, at a bare minimum, everything that is large enough to transport goods in bulk is a public waterway. And we're going to say that's, those are all public. Some states have expanded that definition to also include uh, recreational watercraft. And other states have kind of adopted this, um, no, I'll just move on to the next slide because this explains it all. Uh, the navigability test and the tidal test. So the navigability test is this classic um, it, doctrine that if it's navigable by a boat at, uh, that is capable of uh, transporting things in bulk um, at the time of the state's inception, then that means that it's open to the public. Uh, some state courts have gone further. They said, you know what, that doesn't, Commerce is more than just big barges. It's also being able to put a log on it. If you can get it, you know, you chop a log upstate, you chuck it on the river, it floats down and you get it to a, a mill and to a market. Um, that's commerce, we need to be able to access it. And certain states courts have agreed. 
So Pennsylvania is still very much has to be big barges, um, you know, not necessarily barges, but uh, commerce in bulk is the um, the the statute the court created doctrine. New York, on the other hand, has said if you can float a kayak, that's commerce, right? We're there's no reason to you know mince hairs here. It's uh, if you canoes are commerce. You know, fur trappers were able to take some pelts, put them in the back of their canoe, make it to a market. That's it, right? It's all commerce. And so New York actually has a lot more um, accessibility if you can just prove that it is, um, that it has been used or could be used in that way. Uh, Maryland and Delaware, I'm sorry, Maryland and New Jersey and New York also use uh, the title test. And the title test is that if it's affected by the tides, so the classic um, English version of it, that if the tides affect it, if there is a high and low water mark, then, then it's open to the public. Something else just to throw out because it's kind of important. There's this area between the, the high water mark and the low water mark in the image to the, on the left there that is called the foreshore. And different states have uh, defined that, the, the right to access that differently. And so the, this is for public water. So you imagine if this is private land on the beach and all of that as a private property owner, but the waterway is navigable, right? It's, it's able to be, you know, handle commerce in bulk, then you get the situation, well, what do you do with that little bit when there's no water on it? Is that accessible or not? And so Pennsylvania and Delaware have said, no, that is not, you know, once, if there's water over it, sure. You can, you know, put your canoe as close to the edge as you want. But just because uh, as soon as there's no water, the rights to access that go away. Meanwhile, Maryland, New Jersey, and New York have all said, well, no, that's still publicly accessible. So during low tide, next to a public waterway, you could walk right next to the water and be not trespassing. Um, New Jersey has further expanded that and actually said, no, the reason why we needed uh, access to these waterways is for fishing, for crabbing, for clamming, for, um, and, and, and part of all of that is also access to the shore to spread out your nets, to prepare your pots, that kind of thing. And they said, no, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's public because it's a tidal waterway, then you also have access to the beach that is public property, period. So they really expanded it. Um, So the other kind of way, right? So if it doesn't fall within those state definitions of public as a matter of law, then it can be made public as a matter of agreement. And so I'm gonna talk uh, in just a moment about some of the ways that that can be done. And any owner in the past may have done it. So if you're trying to turn a private waterway into a public waterway, what you kind of need to do is figure out all the people that own riparian property along that, and then check to see if any of them have previously given the rights to the public to access it. And if they have not, then you need to approach them with one of the methods that I'm about to talk about to see if you can gain access to that private waterway by getting them to agree to make it public. So how do we actually do that, right? What can be done? There are three basic paths that I'm gonna kind of go through. The first is that what I was just referring to, this very you know, private individual to individual or organization to individual, please give me some of your rights to this waterway so that more people can access it. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the municipal level where at a municipal level we get to enact zoning ordinances, you get 
building uh, development permits that you know, local boards have a decent amount of control over and so may actually be able to kind of steer things one way or another to help increase access. And then um, on a much larger regional scale, there are some really neat kind of legislative uh, options out there that different states have done to help increase that access. So with private landowners, you can either, you essentially have to negotiate access somehow if you want to get in there. So you can do this through a purchase, through license or an easement. Purchase is the easiest. You can buy the property right? Or somehow you get them to give you all of the rights that they have in their property, whether, you know, is selling their rights to the waterway there, selling their rights to an easement, so, uh, sorry, to an access point, something like that. Uh, there are potential tax write-offs for this. Um, you might be able to negotiate with somebody and say, okay, I get that you don't want to do it while you're alive, but can you do it when you die? Right? Can you put it in your estate plan that you're going to give your property to an organization um, so you won't be bothered by all the kayakers, but whoever owns it next, they'll, you know, they, they can be bothered or, the, you know, the public just has access. Generally, this kind of thing is done to a nonprofit or a municipality. You want to kind of avoid where a private individual has the ability to sell it off in the future. So, um, and you need to make sure that it has enough kind of staying power and the, the, the organizational framework to be able to continue uh, taking care of it for a long period of time. The second option is a license. So license is a, a legal term of art, um, but we are familiar with some, like the license to drive. And a license is essentially a right to do something, but a right that can be taken away or revoked by the person who is giving it to you. And so if you have, um, it, there's snow uh, all around us right now. If you ever go to a ski resort, that is their private property. And by buying a ticket, you are getting a license to be on that property for a day. That license does not transfer to another day. Right? It doesn't give you a right to go on their neighbor's property. And you also can't access it without some of the license like that. So, so you know, someone might take five bucks for you to go out on their lake. Um, somebody might say, you know, we have this waterway access point to this, uh, um, this waterway. So there's this public waterway. You can totally go on that, but you need to pay me $10 to use my boat ramp. Right, that's a, an example of a license. Without paying the money, you don't get to do it. If the person doesn't want to give it to you, they don't have to. Uh, I'll throw out here, um, because it's a really neat thing that people should be aware of. Uh, so rule law statutes, um, recreational use of land and water acts. Every state in the Delaware River Basin has them. And what they do is they protect landowners who open their land to the public for free. Important that it's for free. If they open their land to the public for free, then uh, they are protected from any liability for people being on that property. If somebody was to, you know, so if there's a, a public, you know, waterway going through somebody's private property uh, and somebody was to capsize their boat and hurt themselves in a river, uh, that private property owner does not have any liability because the rule law, uh, the statute protects them. It's just something important to keep in mind because a lot of people and a lot of questions that we get regarding private property owners is, well, I don't want to do this because then kayakers are going to sue me if they get hurt. And so they can sue you, but there's this massive protection and it's meant to be incredibly widely um, and, and broadly interpreted. And I mean, it says it in the statutes, like this is meant to be as widely, broadly interpreted as possible because we want people to open their land to the public. The third way, which is a bit more of a you know, legalistic way to ensure long-term property rights is through what's called an easement. And so I mentioned an easement before where you have a, a right to travel across you know, a, a path on somebody's property. A lot of the paths that cut through Pennsylvania dip into private property. 
So an easement is a recorded document where you would actually have a surveyor come out and say, you know, from a point, you know, five feet off the corner post to the end going in a southerly direction at 47 degrees south, southeast, um, you know, very defined rights, um, goes into a recorded document and says maybe the public has a right to use this easement to uh, get to this river, right, for use for kayaks. And the thing with easements is you really can do a lot with them, right? If you want to say in an easement that it's for kayakers to access the public waterway, you could do that and technically a person taking their canoe or trying to fish there would be illegally on the property, right? Because the easement is for kayakers. Um, yeah, I don't know how that would actually play out in the courts, but you really can limit it a lot. You know, you wouldn't necessarily be opening access um, for everybody. You can also just make it to a couple of people, right? Lots of easements are for, um, you know, two neighbors and, you know, you get an easement that uh, Tom Johnson next door can use my lake for fishing whenever he wants, right? And that way, you know, Tom Johnson next door is good friends with the property owner and they get into that agreement because Tom doesn't want to lose his right to that lake and that person who owns the property may not be there forever. And so it's a way to record it so that no matter who owns the lake property in the future, Tom will always be able to fish. These are things that you can do with easements and they can be made to a particular individual, like I said, a group of individuals, the public at large, they can be for any amount of money. It's all about negotiation and how much it's worth to uh, the person um, who is giving that right away. So those are the three main ways to kind of get a private individual to give up their property rights. Now there are other ways that you can try and protect from a municipal level waterways um, and, th and this is when it comes really back into these urban areas where a lot of changes are being made to the, uh, the, the, the riverfront and how can we possibly kind of create and, and push access while these changes are happening or even better, you know, if you think that your town uh, or area may start to go through something like that in the future, getting these things put in place now may be a way to, to uh, ensure access in the future without necessarily having developers who are fighting against it at the moment. Um, so the first one is called a visual access corridor. It's much more about the sort of aesthetic um, benefits of, of rivers. And so the visual access corridor is a, a zoning ordinance that we that requires riverfront development to incorporate visual access. So as opposed to kind of getting one big long block um, of apartments, it would be that that has to be broken up, right? It's very common for as roads are, you know, if there's a road coming along the, the riverfront, as the road is teeing up, don't put anything in front of it, right? So that they can see all the way out to the river um, and just to not make a big wall in front of it. So that's one way that that can be. And I'll mention that uh, with these, this visual access corridor and the next one, this pedestrian access ordinance, we have uh, examples of these in the guidebook. And you know, you'll be able to actually you know, see one and potentially take one to your local municipality and say, can we pass one of these before all of this development takes place? A pedestrian access ordinance is one that requires riverfront developments to incorporate pedestrian access. I mean, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. And the idea there is that you can get a situation where a development will come in and they'll buy the property they technically own all the way up to the river. And they'll say, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to build all the way up to the river and this chunk of the river and this, you know, beach or whatever may be there, uh, that's, that's for us. That's for our residents, that's for our condo users. Um, 
and that's an amenity that we're going to you know, tout. Well, the pedestrian access ordinance says, no, you can't do that. You have to put you know, a path along, right? Or you have to make some way the pedestrians have a way to get down to that beach as well. You can't just you know, claim it for yourself. This does, uh, it, it's honestly, it, it, it's really good for um, communities to do this. It can be a draw to the area. It can help bring people down there to businesses that are in the area. And so you can really sell this to municipalities because it is, it's an economic boom, all right? And I come from Portland where they have these and the entire waterfront on both sides of the, the Willamette is completely um, open to the public with, you know, paths and everything. And it, it's really, there, there a lot of people use it for running, for biking, for just walking, just to be down there, right? And then you have the points where you can actually go down and get in the river. And so you really can sell it and it really does help people who live near these rivers not get boxed out, right? We wanna make sure people have that access in the future. The next one's buffer zones. I bring up buffer zones because these, these next two are really important because some of the biggest reasons that access to urban waters is less possible, right, uh, is because of what are called combined sewer overflows. So a lot of the general water conditions, right, the factories that were pumping stuff out, Clean Water Act has done an amazing job of handling a lot of those issues, right? Because they're able to put the onus on the factory owners and say, look, that's your pipe. You deal with what's coming out and we're not gonna let you put X, Y, and Z out into our river. You figure it out or you stop. The problem is with the city's uh, sewer systems. And so now with any new system, there's gonna be a separate sanitary sewer system and a stormwater sewer system. But back in the day, uh, they were all the same. And so the you know waste from your house would just kind of enter the sewer system and make its way down to, to the, the, uh, the, 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 the place for everything to be cleaned. Um, but when, there's, when they're combined with the stormwater systems, when there's a heavy rain, if the system can't handle the amount of water, it's designed to just dump it into rivers, right? It's, they're combined sewer overflows. It, water gets to a certain point and it just cascades down and gets dumped into the water. Massive issues for you know, E. coli, um, uh, fecal coliform, um, uh, suspended solids, uh, you know, it's just nasty stuff that goes in and then you have to wait for all of that to kind of be cleaned out before those rivers are safe again. Um, so the buffer zones and uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about green infrastructure, both really help to um, prevent pollution coming from uh, that, those sewer systems um, from making its way into the rivers, right? So. Uh, even if it's not connected to the sanitary sewer things, even when there is an overflow event, it still has gone and dumped across, uh, the water is still coming, it's come across roads, it's picked up pollutants on the way and can still make its way into the rivers. So sorry, uh, buffer zones can help protect the integrity of a water by saying we can't put development within, you know, 100 feet of the, uh, the river. And it's been found out that a 100 foot buffer zone is ideal. Um, it, the, the far diminishing returns past 100 feet, um, but that is ideal for, for doing it. And so it really does help protect animal and plant life. And it's a way to protect the stream without, um, without worrying about sort of the clean water. Uh, having to stop a, a factory. And the green infrastructure is another great way. That's the um, either preventing, you know, cutting off those sanitary sewer overflows or putting in systems like um, wetlands 
um, even if they're artificial wetlands. Um, you can put cuts into sidewalks, right, where there's grass growing in them, uh, wet, you know, little mini wetlands. And all that kind of green infrastructure also helps to relieve the burden on the sewer system by reducing the flow, right? A lot of it is made not necessarily to stop the amount, but to be as a container to stop, to stop it from coming as quickly so that you can dole it out over a lot of time and the um, system can handle it, right? That it would be um, a, a, enough for the water uh, treatment plant to actually handle. So green infrastructure is another great way that a local municipality can work to, uh, to, to, to protect everything. And uh, I know that I'm kind of running out on time here, so I'm gonna um, breeze through these so we have time for questions. So there are a lot of really good legislative solutions that can be done. They are longer and difficult paths to cross, but it is important to, uh, to know that these are out there because other people had fought these battles and did it. So New Jersey passed legislation actually codifying the public trust. And they actually said, we are going to uh, ensure that this isn't just a court created doctrine and that this is statutory doctrine makes it that much harder to kind of overturn it. Uh, courts have to follow it. Courts can't just kind of veer off and you know change the way that it is. So really neat thing that they did. And that's something that you know New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, we could all codify this public trust doctrine, give affirmative duties to the states to um, ensure that public access and give litigators a, a tool, right? If somebody comes in, um, and, and tries to tell somebody, hey, you're trespassing on my land. It's one thing to be able to point to a court case and say, look, there's all this case law that says I should be allowed to be here. That's where a particular judge, group of judges, could say, nah, we don't agree with that anymore. But when you can point to a statute, that's a lot stronger. So that's one way. And all of these are also um, in the guidebook and, and in, their, in full uh, to, to, to give that. Um, the other is to redefine na navigability. So as I mentioned, kind of different states have decided differently how navigability is determined. So a concentrated push to either uh, get the courts to change it, right, with the proper, um, proper case, or to get it uh, statutorily codified as to what navigability means could potentially open it up a lot more. And what's really neat with this is the idea behind the public trust doctrine is that whoever claims to have property rights never actually had them because they were never able to be given them in the first place. They were always in the public's ownership. Uh, so if we were to suddenly say in Pennsylvania, you know what, the public has always had a right to all of the streams, uh, even if they're capable of handling a canoe, property owners could throw up a fit, but the idea behind it is well, you may have thought that you had those rights, but whoever thought they had the rights to give them to you and whoever thought they had the rights to give them to that person, none of them actually had the rights, right? They were always in the public. Um, and that means that you don't actually, you never actually had them, so we're able to take them away and more things could be open. New York essentially made that change. Um, the ERA is a neat thing uh, in Pennsylvania. It just says that uh, the rights to, the people have a right to clean air, water, and the environment. It's not very powerful in courts. We have a couple cases where we're trying to push the doctrine um, and expand it, and especially from an equity standpoint. Um, I've got one right now in the courts where we're trying to say, look, I get that they followed the Clean Air Act, but we need to think about this in a more holistic manner. We need to think about what this particular facility is going to do to this uh, community that is already suffering from bad air, that's already suffering from um, bad water. So it can be potentially a way to try and move a little bit beyond uh, the statutes. Build bridges and build access is, I think, a genius idea. Um, Maryland says that if they're ever doing repair work or building a new bridge, they now have to incorporate uh, access to the riverfront at that bridge. 
And the, the genius about it is that normally there is a parking lot where they'll stage everything while they're building the bridge or doing the repairs where all of the you know, cement trucks and all of that sit. And normally they'll just take those out and kind of like, you know, put a couple bushes or something. And what this says is, no, leave that, make it a better parking lot. And that way people that are already using these bridges to access it don't just have to park on the side of the road, which is dangerous. And we're gonna make some stairs to go down to the waterfront uh, to make it easier for people. And the idea also behind that is that by not having to refurbish the parking lot, you save enough money to put stairs down to the waterway. Uh, so it's really just a, a neat idea and a, a different marshalling of resources uh, to help increase uh, waterway access. And there's no reason that uh, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania, and, uh, New York, uh, and New Jersey not only couldn't do it, but it, there's really no reason why they wouldn't want to do it, right? It's, it's a win, 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 win situation, uh, which is very rare. So really neat idea. Um, and then a lot that can be done with the Clean Water Act, right? There, you can monitor, um, get river keepers in there. And this is back to that increasing access by simply making the waterways safer to be in and making waterways, um, making the perception of waterways safer, right? A lot of people don't want to uh, swim in the Monongahela uh, or the Delaware because of this sort of historic um, problems that were there. But really, we can, um, you, you can increase the, the, the access by convincing people that, hey, these really are better, right? People have been working for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years to make these waterways safe and swimmable. Let's let you know about it. Let's create these access points in the cities. Let's get people down to these beaches and into the water. So thank you very much. Um, the, I, I will mention the Waterway Guidebook. We are putting the last finishing touches on it. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Um, we'll send stuff out. We, we, we should be done it in the next, probably by the new year, honestly. Um, and so hopefully we can um, uh, get that out and, and you'll be able to find it and it will hopefully serve as a really good resource for everybody. Awesome, thank you, Tim. And thank you for those of you who put your questions in the chat. Um, even if you have like a hard out at two and you have questions and you're worried, well, I'm not going to be around to hear the answers, still put your questions in the chat because when the recording goes up, you'll get to hear Tim's answers. Um, so I'm just going to go through the ones that were asked during the presentation. So Tim, uh, Lisa asked, do property rights supersede zoning and homeowner associations? Uh, depends on the situation. Um, so generally no except if the zoning gets put in after then there can be issues with uh, what's called takings and so taking is when a government decision affects private property rights and the um the the, the current owners are generally allowed to keep their same property rights despite new zoning Awesome. And then Bryce had a question. I'm like 95% certain it is in reference to the concept if you're allowing people to access your land for free, then they can't sue you. But Bryce, if I'm wrong, feel free to take yourself off mute. But he's asking, uh, does that concept also include if you open up your land for hunting? Uh, I th think it does. I do think it does. I, I know most states that have it would have a list of what is protected under them. And so there's a weird quirk like in um, New York, they don't mention swimming. And there's a case, weird case where because swimming wasn't on the protected list, it was um, deemed not to be protected. And somebody that was swimming and hurt themselves was um, allowed to sue the property owner. Lisa also asked if the riparian area is privately owned, does that mean that the owner can do anything that they want with that swath of land? If the, rip, uh, if the, if the riparian land is privately owned, that they can do whatever they want with that swath of land? Uh, if the river was public and the riparian land was private, then the, rip, the, the landowner would not be able to do anything that would harm or hinder 
uh, the public's right to access that waterway, right? You wouldn't be able to put a dock out um, all the way out to the edge that might prevent somebody or hurt somebody. You wouldn't be able to like fill it in um, and change the course of the waterway. Um, but the land itself, yes, as long as it complied with zoning and, and other things like that, you could do whatever you wanted on the shore. Okay, so uh, can I just- Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Uh, clarify that a little bit. My question is like, so, so they, could, they could conceivably, you know, dump toxic material there. Oh, no, no, no. No, that would all turn into like Clean Water Act issues. Okay, so, so they can't do anything to the land that would impact the water. Is that, is that right? right? Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would run into a situation where like the Clean Water Act, as opposed to having the pipe leading out and, you know, landing in the water, you just cut the pipe six inches short and have it land on land. Right. right. And yeah. that's, you know, I mean, they, that, that, was, that was thought about. <laughs> Or just physically dump stuff. Right. No, if it's going to make it to the riverways, then it's a Clean Water Act violation, period. Okay. Awesome. Um, Erica asked, and Tim, this might be out of your wheelhouse, um, but other folks uh, may have answers on the line. Are there any funding opportunities to offer trips to rural access points um, from urban communities um, thinking that this is a crucial reparation? Yeah, it's out of my wheelhouse. I'm sure that there are funding opportunities out there. If not, then funding opportunities should be made. Um, but I'm not aware of anything in particular um, that is that is like working to do that or, or getting that money out. Anybody else on the line that happens to know? It's a great question. Definitely something to look into. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Erica saying that she figured she would ask. Um, that's all the. I could add something. Um, oh, go ahead, Karen. Related to that, um, I know the um, refuge, the National Wildlife Refuges, uh, they get grants, or the Friends of the Refuge gets a grant from Fish and Wildlife, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, to bring children. This is just one idea. I'm just throwing it out as 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 idea generating. Um, from urban schools to come to the refuge for environmental education. So that's a little different. The person was looking for more, I, I, I interpreted the question as looking for recreational opportunities, but there's an, there's an example for educational opportunity. Um, uh, uh, Creek Connections in our region does that as well. Cool. And then that was the last question that we had in the chat. And we are right on time because we are all so good at this. Yes. Uh, but thank you, Tim, so much. This was super informative. Um, and I hope that all of our attendants, oh, you're getting some claps and thank yous. You did a great job. Um, like I said, this will be up for your reference um, later today or on Monday, you know, if you want to spend a cool winter day re-watching this presentation. Um, but once again, thank you to everyone. And our fourth and final webinar in this series will be happening in January. Um, it'll be going over urban education um, for youth to pipelining them to be environmental leaders. Um, so I hope to see many of you there. And once again, big thank you to Tim um, and his contact information is up if you have any other questions. Thanks everyone.